Well, good morning, church. It's good to see you. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's back. (laughs) Hopefully you guys are back and there's not people staying at home saying, I can't take another week of Pastor Austin. But uh, hey, I'm I'm grateful to be uh, with you this morning. If you're joining online, we just want to say welcome. We're so glad that that you are here uh, watching with us. And if there's anything that we can do, just please reach out and we'll, we'll be sure to respond to you. We are continuing our series on the Holy Spirit. Last week, I shared a lot of good information about the baptism of the Holy Spirit as evidence in speaking in spiritual language. And I want to reiterate this statement and so everybody hears me. You do not have to speak in a spiritual language to be saved. It's a separate event, okay? Just want to put that out there so that we're all on the same page. If you've got your Bibles this morning, you can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I said you could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There it is. We get excited about the Word of God, not just 8.30 half excited about the Word of God. We celebrate it. This morning I have a goal and I have a desire. It's my goal to help us further understand how the gifts of the Spirit are to operate within the church and to bring clarity between personal spiritual language, spiritual language that's meant for interpretation, and prophecy. And as we look to uh, 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, yes, buckle in, buckle your seatbelts, Paul gives instructions on how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. And it's important to know this if you're taking notes. Believers should use spiritual gifts in a way that serves others and reveals God's grace to them. Spiritual gifts given from God are always to encourage and always to point people to Christ. That has and forever will be the purpose of God pouring out his spirit and demonstrating his spirit in a powerful way. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit gifts should always point people to Christ. But my desire is that all of us take time to not seek gifts, to not seek manifestations, but to give our full attention and our full affection to the giver of these gifts. Time spent with God is love. I I love my children, and so what do I do? I give them my time. I, I, I love Elizabeth, and what do I do? I give her my time. And at the end of today's service, we'll leave room to spend time with Jesus. And tonight, we'll have even more opportunity to spend time with God. There is no lose in today's response. I I want people to hear this. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 8 says, Come near to God, and he will come near to you. How many would say this morning that you could use just a little bit more Jesus in your life? Right? You could say, I could just use a little bit more Jesus in my marriage. Uh, any parents in the room, I could use a little more Jesus in my parenting, right? In, in my relationships, in my workplace. My desire is that we all draw near to God. And if gifts begin to flow, great. We might have some more insight on how to use them and how to make sense of them. But if not, there is no loose because we're all closer with the Lord. Before we pray, or before we read scripture, let let us pray. God, I thank you for this message. I pray that your spirit would rest upon me in these words, that you continue to do a work in my heart. I pray, God, that you would communicate clearly through me. I yield to you and help me to communicate what I feel that you've given me this morning. Open up our hearts and our minds. May we receive from your word, not word of man, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen, amen. First Corinthians chapter 12, and this is where Paul begins to unpack uh, the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, and uh, we're going to start in, in verse 4. He says this, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working But in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Verse 7, now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the what? Common good. Again, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit is for the common good. 
It's to build people up and to point them to Jesus. So as we continue to read, and we'll read through these nine gifts, we'll unpack them later on in this series, but as we read through this, keep in mind that what Paul is talking about is for the common good. These gifts are meant to benefit more than just an individual. They're meant to benefit us, the church, the body of believers. So continuing in verse eight, to the one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, interpretation of tongues. And and I'll stop there, just a a recap of last week. Tongues is an old-fashioned word or an antiquated word for language. So when it says speaking in tongues, it's just saying speaking in a different language, right? Verse 11, all of these, all these are the work of one and the same spirit as he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. So when Paul in this verse mentions speaking in different types of tongues in, in, in verse 10, he is referring at this point to a corporate tongue meant for interpretation. How do we know that? Because in verse 7, he, he clarifies and he says that these gifts that I'm going to be talking about are for the what? The common good. And in order for it to benefit everyone, there must be an interpretation to bring clarity and to bring understanding. Now, this gift that Paul is talking about here is different than the gift of the Holy Spirit as expressed in personal tongues. Okay, um, Jack Hayford, Robert Morris, they like to explain it this way. Personal prayer language is the grace gift of the Spirit. Uh, um, Corporate spiritual language is the gift of the Spirit. So it's it's the grace of tongues and it's the gift of tongues. That might help some of you distinguish those, but um, here Paul is talking clearly about the corporate. But some of you are asking, what's the difference between personal spiritual language and uh, a spiritual language meant for interpretation? Well, let's take a little detour, okay? Personal, if you're taking notes, Personal spiritual language is the gift of utterance in unknown languages meant for private devotion. You are built up in your faith, and the Holy Spirit helps you intercede and communicate with God on his level. This builds up only you and is meant for you to do in private. That's personal spiritual language. Romans 8 The same author, Paul, is writing to the Romans, and in verse 26, he says this, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, okay? The Holy Spirit's role, uh, the Spirit of God, is described as a helper and an advocate, right? That is his role. He helps us. He intercedes. He guides us. He speaks truth to us and in us and for us. So we continuing on. We do not know, Paul says, what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Have you ever had a moment in your life where you just feel like you're at a loss of words? Anybody? I I know this is gonna be hard for some of you to believe, but there have been many times in my life where I've been at a loss of words. Um, In my parenting, my kids say something and I feel my blood pressure just rapidly rising. It's just like, boom, instant there. I'm like, God, I don't know what to say. I don't know how to hear my children and what they need in this moment. I don't know how to respond to that question. Anybody got a question from a curious kid and you're like, Lord, I was not ready for that on this Tuesday. Help me, Jesus, right? In my parenting, in, in medical emergencies, Right? Has anybody been in an accident? You're like fear and panic and uncertainty, and you don't know what to do or what to say. In in crossroads in life where you're confused of what is the next step and where to go and, and, and what you even need. There's been moments in my life where I've felt such a deep love for the Lord that words just could not express what I was feeling in that moment. 
And all the wives in the room are like, honey, listen, like, don't you feel that about me, right? (laughs) This is where praying in a spiritual language is practical. When we don't know how or what to pray, the Holy Spirit helps us pray exactly what needs to be prayed. When our language becomes insuffice, his language is a grace that is given to us to help us communicate perfectly with him. Isaiah chapter 55, verses eight and nine. The prophet said, says this, and he's speaking from the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. He says, for my thoughts are, are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So in, instead of, of, of God allowing us to communicate from a place of limited understanding, he brings us up to his perspective and to his understanding. If I pray in English, that's fine, and God can still understand that. But what happens is God comes down to our limited perspective, to our limited thoughts, to our limited understanding, and we're communicating on this level. But when spiritual language begins to flow, that is God allowing me or allowing the believer, allowing us to to actually pray with his perspective and his understanding. His thoughts are higher. His ways are higher. Who can know them? That's why we need the spirit to help us. You know, for um, me personally, are you guys okay if I tell a couple personal stories? Great, I'm glad. No one's, <laughs> come on, 8.30, wake up. <laughs> when, when I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was different than how my wife was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I was 12 years old, and we were over in the Green Sanctuary, which is our student campus auditorium now, and there was a guest speaker. I don't remember if it was Dean Niferatus or if it was Johnny Jernigan. What a name, right? Johnny Jernigan. Um, and, and I was at the altar, and it was on a Sunday morning. And I went forward, and, and Seth Applegate was beside me. And I remember praying and just feeling so much love from God. And I just began to pour my heart out. Just, just God, I love you so much. Thank you so much. And, and it just felt like my heart just was trying to express something that my words could not do. And I'm out loud, I'm praying, God, I love you, I love you, I love you. And it just began to bubble up. And in that moment, his spirit just overflowed, it immersed me, and I began to speak in a spiritual language. And and it was an incredible experience. It was where my words fell short, his spirit took over. For my wife, she grew up a pastor's kid also. Both of her, actually she was like double pastor kid. She was pastor, pastor kid. Both of her parents are pastors. They still are. They're wonderful, godly people. And she would spend weeks and weeks of the summer at camps. And uh, her entire childhood, her entire teens, she, she would be at camps three, four weeks. You know, that feels like the perfect atmosphere to receive Um, just more of God because you're just there and everybody's on fire for God and there's not temptations, right? But that didn't happen for her in that way. And she's 18 years old and she went up to pray for one of her friends that she knew was going through something. And she just began to lay a hand on her friend. She began to out loud, but she didn't have the words for it. And she just began to flow right then and right there. It wasn't some spectacular moment. It wasn't some emphasis. It wasn't, it was just where the words were insuffice on our limited understanding is when the Spirit of God, the helper, the advocate came alongside and helped give the words that needed to be said. So you might ask the question, well, how are you built up if you don't understand what's being said? Right? If I'm speaking in another language and I don't know this language, how am I encouraged does, does the Spirit interpret what is being prayed for so that you know what you're praying for? I think these are great questions. I'm glad that you asked them to me this morning. Does the Spirit interpret what is uh, being prayed? Typically, no. I'm, I'm not going to say that that could not happen, but typically, no. But what happens when, when my heart is being poured out, when my attention My thoughts, my emotions, my heart, my desire are being placed in one direction, but I run out of words. The Spirit begins to help me pray in a spiritual language. I know that in that moment, the Holy Spirit is helping my spirit articulate 
what I'm struggling to say. And as I pray in the spiritual language, I might not know exactly what I'm saying, but I know that my heart is in that direction. I know that my, 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 my inner being, my emotions, my, my desire is being placed in that way, and I trust that the Spirit is helping. How many have ever been um, on a mission trip out of the country, right? Those of you without your hands up, I would encourage you, it's worth every penny of an investment, not only to the kingdom of God, but in your personal life. We've got opportunities, El Salvador, Poland, Southeast Asia, I believe in uh, uh, Thailand, yep, with Pearson Megan Davis, um, and I would encourage you to go on this, but I've been fortunate to be on, on several trips, and there's been many times where I've had the locals, whether it was in Haiti or El Salvador or one time in particular in Swaziland, which is now Eswatini, and these local believers came around and they laid hands on our mission team and they began to pray in their language. Now, if you know me and you've heard me preach much, you know that English is not my strong suit, right? I misspeak, I, I say things that aren't right and my mom corrects me um, and, and I'm thankful for that most of the time. Um, <laughs> But as these people are, are laying their hands and praying on me, I have no idea what they're saying. I've got, I've got no clue. But my spirit feels so encouraged in that moment. Why? Because my spirit bears witness that as they're praying, they have my best interest in mind. That's the same exact thing that happens when we pray in a personal spiritual language. You might not intellectually know what's being said, but your spirit just knows that God has got your back, that he's got your best interest in mind. He knows exactly what we need in that moment. That is personal, or, or the grace of tongues, personal spiritual language. So long detour, jumping back to scripture. Uh, Paul continues in verse 13 through 26. I'm not gonna read it, but Paul talks about how we're different parts of the same body and how a foot can't be upset that it's not a hand because a foot has a role just as a hand has a role. And the eye can't be upset that it's not a nose because they have roles. Now, I, I want you to hear me this morning. Sometimes we need to grow more comfortable in who we are and the giftings that God has given us. This is not a comparison game. You don't look to your pastor or look to your spouse or look to anybody else. Maybe I should word it this way. Our, our superintendent um, said it, uh, not Pastor Brian, but Pastor Brian reminded me, that's why I pointed to him. Uh, uh, he, he, he said something this week. He said, you need to grow comfortable in who you're not. Right? I think we need to understand that we're all different parts. But here in verses 13 through 26, what's Paul doing? He's reiterating that these gifts are for the church as a whole. So skipping down to verse 27, he begins to wrap things up. Now, you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healings, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all, do all work miracles? Do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? Now eagerly desire the greater gifts. Why does he emphasize the greater gifts? Right? Right? Because he's talking about gifts meant for the body, not personal time. There have been people that have used Paul's rhetorical question in verse 30 to try and prove that personal spiritual language is not for everyone. But that's not the point I believe that he is making. Uh, who, who did Paul say that these gifts were in verse 7? The common good. Right In verses 13 through 26, what is he describing? He's describing one body with many parts, how the body of Christ, meaning the church, have different gifts. Paul is just saying, not all of you are going to give a corporate tongue. And because if everyone did, then we'd have no one to interpret it. So um, his rhetorical question has to do with corporate tongues and not the personal gift of prayer language. And if you happen to disagree with me, I want you to know, I'm just doing the best to read the word of God and if, if we disagree about this, let's just agree about Jesus. Let there never be disunity over secondary theology. I, I, I want us to, to be encouraged by the Spirit and full of the Spirit and not get um, divided 
about disagreement, right? So continuing on, Paul talks in, in chapter 13, still in this theme of spiritual gifts, he begins to, to tell us how to use these gifts. He says in verse 1 of 13, if I speak in the tongues of men or language of men or the language of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if, if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then Paul goes on to describe what is love. Love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast. And, and you begin to see Love and action. Now, this is incredibly important to understand. If the gifts are meant for encouraging others, then they have to be operated in a spirit of love. How do we ensure that we operate in love? Well, that's by living full of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever wondered, just in a moment of honesty, why someone who is unkind or maybe not very holy has experienced a spiritual language or has had a gift flow through them in a moment, but you haven't? Anybody ever had that thought? I know I have. I know there's been a lot of discouraged, godly teenagers come back from camp where they saw someone, you know, speaking in tongues at an altar moment, but they didn't receive it in that moment. And then on the way home, you know, that, that same kid that was baptized in the Holy Spirit, they're trying to make out with a girl in the back of the bus or something. Okay, that, that, not at our church, other churches, okay? Um, and I know none of you did that as a teenager. Last week, I, I gave an illustration of, uh, of just a cup, and this water represents the Spirit of God. And, and as we have spiritual discipline, as we spend time with God, as we pour our affection on God, as we spend time his word, he, he begins to fill us, right? And then at some point, that spirit just begins to immerse us where it begins to overflow, right? And you guys, that is the physical evidence of an outward point. I'll do that again just a little bit, right? It's water, and I need a drink. <laughs> but what I didn't tell you last week is that all of us leak, and unless we are going to address the issues that are causing the leaking of the Spirit of God in our lives, it's going to be uh, difficult to, to stay full, right? That's why someone in a moment can experience an overpouring because it doesn't matter how many holes I've got in this cup, God's Spirit is infinite. He could just dump it out on someone, right? And so in a moment of a manifestation where the Spirit of God completely immerses them, that's one thing, right? But it's a completely different thing to live daily full of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear me this morning. I'm more, uh, my desire and our desire as pastors of this church is that we would live full of the Holy Spirit and not be so concerned with being immersed in the Holy Spirit. Because you can be immersed for a moment and live like a pagan the rest of the week. What happens is God begins to speak us to spiritual disciplines and he begins to plug those holes. And, and, and we'll talk a little bit about those holes tonight, what those could be, but I want you to hear me. What is, what is in Galatians chapter five when it talks about the fruit of the spirit, meaning the fruit of a spirit-filled believer, the first one, Galatians 5.22, is what? Love. The fruit of the spirit is love. We need the, the spiritual discipline to be people of the Spirit, full of the Spirit. And if he happens to boil, you know, bubble over and, and just have a, an outpouring, that's great. But hear me this morning, church. Let's not desire an experience. Let's desire to be full of God's Spirit. Why? So that we can operate in love and bring glory and honor to his name forever and ever. Continuing on, chapter 14. You're gonna jump to verse one. Follow the way of love. Again, he's reiterating what he's been talking about. And eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. So here he's switching and he's talking about 
uh, individual tongue, right? Because it's not coupled with interpretation. Verse three, but the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. I want to stop here and define what biblical prophecy is. Verse 3, Paul very clearly states, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their what? Their what? Their strengthening, their what? Encouragement and their? Their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. This is biblical prophecy. Now, prophecy is a gift that enables a Christ follower to deliver a message from God under the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Its purpose is to strengthen, to uh, comfort, and to encourage God's people to do what is right and to remain true to God, to always build up and not tear down. A, A true prophetic message is initiated by God, not by man. Although the delivery is in part subject to the one who speaks it. Such a message is not to be regarded as foolproof or on the same level as scripture, but if the message is truly from God, it always aligns with what God has always revealed to us through his word, through the Bible. If if someone is going to speak with what might be considered a prophetic word into your life, it better align with what scripture says. Otherwise, you can just kind of take it with a grain of salt and, and, and dismiss that. Now, I'm, I'm, Paul, in this moment, is saying, seek that. God wants to speak strengthening and encouraging and comforting things through each and every one of you. And I'm sorry, I don't have time to go deeper into prophecy and what it's not, or to talk about how to give a prophetic word so that it's received by both believers and unbelievers. There's a lot to go into this, and, um, but I just don't have the time today. If you've got questions about that, reach out to me. I'd, I'd be happy uh, for you to buy me lunch and we can talk, you know, or whatever. <laughs> Um, we're going to jump back to, to verse four. And this is Paul talking about personal tongues again. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. Again, in five, I would like every one of you to speak in a spiritual language, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers and sisters, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you unless I bring some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Jumping down to verse 13. For this reason, the one who speaks in a tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. There it is. It's what I talked about earlier. Your spirit is praying, but your mind, you don't, you don't understand that. So what do we do in that? For, um, so what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. Otherwise, when you are praising God in the spirit, how can someone else who is now put in the position of an inquirer say amen to your thanksgiving? Since they don't even know what you're saying. You are giving thanks well enough, but no one else is edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, so he's saying, I thank God in my personal time, I speak in tongues more than all of you. But in the church, he says, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Paul clearly puts it. I thank God that I personally speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church, I would rather speak so that others can understand. I I, I want people to hear this because this is a question and um, maybe there's different backgrounds and experiences, but if you are praying in your personal language while at church, it's better if you were to pray in English so that others can be edified, so that others can can be built up. Or if you do at a a volume where it's not distracting to other believers. Paul is very clear about order 
and, and doing things with everyone's best interest in mind. Now, I'm not, I don't have anybody in mind. I'm not rebuking anyone. And I understand I'm not trying to squelch the spirit in this moment. But what I'm trying to do is it can be distracting and not edifying to me when someone is praying in their spiritual lung, language right behind my ear and I'm trying to intellectually engage with the Lord at this moment. And so that's the private, personal time of devotion. Now, are there times where you might have spirit-filled believers that you get together and you just say, you know what, let's all begin. We, we all have understanding of what's happening. I think that that's okay. And there's been moments where, well, you know, you might have that in a smaller thing. But when we're in church, let's pray so that the person next to you may be edified. You know what I noticed, church? And, and this is just a, a gentle rebuke, so please hear my heart. When Pastor Jeff began to pray, I heard his voice. What would happen if we began to out loud pray for people? What, what would that be like if instead of just allowing Pastor Jeff to pray for, for um, Lily and, and what she's gonna be going through and Sandy, that if the whole church lifted their voice in English so that we can all be edified and we can all pray together. What would happen if when we have missionaries come up here and we lay hands on them and we pray for them or there's a baby dedication and we're dedicating that, that these parents, these moms, these dads would hear the voice of you and be encouraged because you are speaking out loud. Church, I think it's time that, that we begin to use our words and, and prophesy to strengthen, to encourage, to comfort and begin to pray out loud. Now, I know that's different. I'm not saying that you have to do that to come here, but I will say that there is power and that's the purpose of coming together. Verse 27, say, stick to your notes, Austin. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or th at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and he speak to himself and to God. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. So he's saying, there it is, right? Like, I'm not condoning spiritual language. I'm just saying, let's, let's edify each other. Let's build each other up. Verse 40, the nice bow on everything. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Now, I, I know we just read a lot, and I'd encourage you in your own time to go back to reread all of chapters 12, 13, and 14 and read them as one continuous text and not just picking things out because I, I skipped a lot of great stuff in there. But Paul gives some rules to corporate spiritual language and how it's to be used in the church. And, and you can put those on the screen. The first rule is it's better to pray in understanding so that all may be encouraged. When we gather together, it's better to pray in English. He says this in verse one, verse five, verse 19. Second rule, if a corporate tongue or a spiritual language is given, it must be interpreted. Now, I, I wanna clarify what interpretations are. Interpretation does not equal translation. Just like an interpreter that would interpret the president of the United States, he is saying the essence of the speaker's thoughts. And so, um, if you're in the South and you hear an interpretation, you might hear y'all. <laughs> you think God speaks like y'all? My dad would say so. He's from Texas. <laughs> but it just takes on a little bit of the personality of the person that God is flowing through in that moment. Third rule is the one who gave the corporate tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. In verse 13, we see that. Fourth rule, no more than three tongues in interpretation should be given in this service. That's in verse 27. Why, why does that need to be a rule? Well, I think at this time, Paul is talking to a very excited group of believers. And they're getting in these, these uh, church services and revivals breaking out and everybody's super excited, but they've been given this new tool and they don't understand how to use it. Anybody ever been given a gift and you're super excited, but you realize many years later that you had no idea what to do with it or how to use it? Uh, don't judge my parents for this, but when I was in five or six, uh, fifth or sixth grade, um, I, I received a, a, a buck knife. Um, like, it's like a fixed blade, like five inch. It's got like the hook on it, you know, a serrated blade and everything. And I'm like, a, what is a sixth grader gonna do with that besides get in trouble, right? Well, you know what I did with it? 
I just wore it on the side of my belt and I'd like bring it to church. I remember Pastor Bud telling me like, Austin, we probably shouldn't have a fixed blade knife, you know, on your side. And, and I was given this gift and I didn't really understand what the real purpose was for it. That's all that, that Paul is doing. He's giving instructions as God has given his gift to us. He's just saying, listen, don't abuse it. Don't wheel it around. Don't, don't do this. There's a purpose for this, and it becomes a powerful tool in this. And the fifth rule, and this is where, really where my heart is for us as a church, is to desire the gifts that build up the church. See that in verse 5, 39, all throughout it, just saying, hey, if there's going to be a tongue, let there be and interpretation so that we all can be encouraged. This is my heart. Hebrews 10, verse 24 and 25 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day, the day of the Lord, the day of judgment approaching. That's the purpose of gathering together. That's why we assemble, is to encourage one another. I want you to ask yourself this question. This is a question that I've had to ask myself this week. When you come to church, are you more concerned about receiving encouragement? Or are you more concerned with saying, God, how might you use me? How might you use my words to strengthen to encourage or to comfort my brother and sister in Christ? Was it was a good day at church based on what you received or was it a good day on church based on what happened in our family? That we begin to celebrate breakthrough in someone else's life instead of saying, well, why did their prodigal return when I've been praying for 15 years for mine? This is a family. Can, can we be encouraged by one another? If, if you're just wanting encouragement just from the pastor, let me tell you, I don't have enough to, to pour out on everybody. There's too many. I can't do it in my physical uh, myself. But each of you have access to the Spirit of God to fill your hearts, to begin to speak to you so that you might encourage others. You know what encouraged me every week? Junior Van Gorp. That man calls me every week. He's like my, my favorite telemarketer. <laughs> and he encourages me. That's a gift. He says, how are you doing, pastor? I've been praying for you. How's your family? How's your kids? Let me tell you about this. Could we have some more juniors here? Could we have some more people that aren't so concerned about a moment of being immersed, but living full of the Spirit of God? Would you stand to your feet? We're gonna spend time in prayer. And I want you to put away all distractions, close your eyes, open your heart. But we're ending where we started, James 4, 8. He says, if you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Just close your eyes and listen to that scripture. There's power in the scripture. If you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. I want all that God has for me, and I know that you want the same. So Holy Spirit, we yield to you. We give you our time, which is our love. We give you our attention. We ask that you would help us to encounter you, to not serve you with lips, but that where intellect and our heart would align and begin to pour out to you, God. So this morning, we give you time, we give you space, and we love you. In just a moment, I'm gonna ask anyone who, who uh, is comfortable just to come forward to the altar and say, God, I want more of you. You can stay in your seats, um, but I do believe sometimes just an outward expression of just saying, you know what, I'm gonna move physically as a representation of my heart's cry and come down and we're just gonna spend the next five or six minutes and we're gonna worship and invite the Holy Spirit. But before we do this, just with every eye closed and head bowed, if there's anyone here that has not yet surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, that if you were to die tomorrow, you say, I don't know if I would make it in heaven. 
I don't know that I would be there with my grandma or with my parents or with my sibling or whatever. And I need the assurance of salvation, not based on what I can do, but based on what Christ has done. And if that's you this morning, you say, I'm asking Jesus to forgive me of my sin, to cleanse me. I admit that I am sinful. I admit that I could not make a way, but I'm relying on the faith or on the, the grace of Jesus Christ. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? I wanna pray for you if there's anyone here. I wanna give opportunity. Yes. Is there anyone else? Yes. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you for these two hands. I pray, Lord, that you would give them that assurance that we bind the lips of Satan and the lies that he throws. And so I pray a washing of your spirit come over these two individuals. And I pray, God, that you would set their feet on a path of righteousness, that your spirit would be in them and with them, and you'd begin to move in their life in a powerful way. God, we are here for you and bless these two in Jesus' name. Amen. Now let's sing this song, um, Fresh Wind. And would you come forward if you want more of God? There is no lose. He will draw near to you. Amen.